everyone. I know you are all waiting to listen to this topic entitled Winner or Sinner. By the way, it's actually uh, our topic uh, during the All Saints Day, okay? And it's gonna be our Holy Wind special message. That That's why I, I put uh, uh, a tagline under this topic, All Soul Winners Day. In other words, we will be focusing on how are we going to win uh, the lost souls for Jesus, okay? The lost, the least, and the lost. So, let's get started, okay? Uh, according to some, someone, okay, the anonymous, an idle mind is the workshop of the devil. Remember, transformation happens in our lives by the renewing of our minds. And that mind that we possess should not be idle. As we all know, somebody said an idle mind, a mind that is uh, is not functioning well, a mind that is so, uh, you know, not uh, always used in something worthwhile is the workshop of the devil. And the devil wants to fill up our imagination. The devil wants to clutter up our minds with things that are ungodly and not belong to the things that are in heaven. So, very important that our lives uh, will be more meaningful. And it could, it could only be more meaningful once we decided to dispense that life to others. Again, we won't allow our lives or our, our lives to be worthless. So we want to have that mind that is not passive, much more a mind that is active. Like what I said, uh, uh, like what I got from somebody uh, who, who told this long time ago, an idle mind is the workshop of the day. So I have a question for all of you, a question, uh, a serious question that demands a serious answer. What is the heart of God for humanity? Probably readily you would answer uh, my question, uh, happiness, or it could be prosperity. Uh, if, you got, if you're going to ask me what is the heart of God for humanity, I believe it's not just focusing on your happiness. Much more God wants you to move from happiness to joy. Why? Because happiness can only be dictated by the what external things. When something happens, uh, you are happy. Why? Because uh, there's something outside that uh, contributed, okay, that, that gave a good feeling. For you, that's why you are happy. But joy is not dependent on uh, external things. Much more, joy is the fruit of the Holy Spirit and it's coming from within. That's why Apostle Paul keeps on encouraging the Philippian church rejoice. Not just rejoice, but rejoice in the Lord. Why rejoice in the Lord? Because you can rejoice in some other things. Don't just rejoice in the Lord, but rejoice in the Lord always. So, the heart of God for humanity is not just to have happiness, much more. God has, uh, has been desiring in his heart that we must, okay, that we might have joy. But what is the real heart of God for humanity? Uh, one verse in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. Okay, as we all know, God promise a long time ago but he is not slow in keeping his promise and we need to realize that we are not just promise receiver we are the children of promise and every revelation of god leads us to the fulfillment of those promises that he released long time ago the lord is not slow in keeping his promise according to second peter as some understand slowness Probably you are so uh, sick and tired waiting for the answers of God uh, to all those things that you prayed for Him. But the Bible keeps on telling us the Lord is not slow in keeping His promise. As some understand slowness, instead He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. I want you to see the character of God here. God is so patient with us. God is not slow in keeping His promise. But this is what uh, reveals the heart of God. He is not wanting anyone to perish. He is not wanting anyone to be destroyed or to be, you know, to, to, to experience a worthless life or, uh, you know, but, uh, but according to this uh, passage, okay, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come 
to repentance, everyone to come to a sudden shift of mentality, a shift of perspective, a shift of uh, normal focus. And as we all know, the meaning of repentance is relative. Many would say that repentance is a what a 300 or 180 degree turn from sin to God. It's turning from sin to God for them. That's repentance. Others would 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 define repentance as having the thinking of God, a higher thinking as compared to your former way of thinking. Is uh, as the Bible tells us, His ways are higher than our ways, and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But it goes beyond that. Many would say that repentance is a change of mind, but it could also be an exchange of mind. Why? Because the Bible tells us we have the mind of Christ. And God has been desiring that that kind of mind would, would really be manifested uh, around the people, you know, in front of many people. But let's go beyond that definition repentance is a radical okay sometimes we hit the word radical but the word radical came from the latin word radix it means to cut to the root radical is not a dirty or a bad word but radical is a word that we will we would be desiring to use why because repentance is a radical change of mind about what about the character of god i personally believe that transformation doesn't happen overnight Transformation is a process. That's why the uh, Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he said, Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. He was uh, so aware that this world has a pattern. According to him, we do not receive the spirit of the world. This is what he said. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by what? By the renewing of our minds and transformation is not an overnight thing and i personally believe many people are believing that once we experience revival readily we will have the so-called transformation we love revival we desire revival but let us face the reality that the revival come and go Sometimes you would wait for uh, uh, next six months in order for you to experience another revival. We keep on looking for a revival. What if the reality is you are the revival? It's one thing to have a revival, but it's another thing to have a theological reformation. In other words, we need to have a radical uh change when it comes to our perspective of who God is. Why the identity of God would reveal to us our identity. Many times, okay, there are messages flooding over the pulpit that mischaracterize our God. Okay, it gives us uh, adjectives that are uncharacteristic of Him. In other words, we want every people on the planet to have a radical shift, a radical shift of perspective, a radical shift of concept about who God is. And the Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. If we're going to talk about the the context, okay, as we all know, Peter wrote this letter, okay, during the the Neronic persecution, okay? Nero was the emperor then. He was, and he uh, was really looking for Christians to be killed and, and be butchered and murdered. But uh, Peter said in his letter, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. He's actually addressing this message to those uh, Jews, uh, to those believing Jews, to those who people who became part of the kingdom. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise. Probably some of them are experiencing uh, fear. They were scared uh, about the Neronic persecution. But this is what He said to them. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone you to perish, not wanting anyone you to be part of that impending destruction. But everyone will come to a radical change of mind about the character of God. And this is our role as a Christian 
instead of having an idle mind and eventually absorbing a negative, deceptive thoughts and eventually became a sinner, much more we want to be a winner. We want people to receive a message that would radically change their perspective of who God is. Okay, the next thing we need to consider is in Luke chapter 15 verse 7. It says here, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Bear in mind, Jesus said, He came for the sinner, not for the righteous. I was so shocked seeing uh, that verse that Jesus did not come for the righteous only to find out that Jesus did not come for those people who think that they are righteous. Those people who are, whose basis of righteousness is allegiance to the law. Hey, I want you to take note of this. The very righteousness that we have, the moment we receive Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, is Jesus Himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, Christ is our wisdom. Christ is our salvation. Christ is our sanctification or righteousness. Christ is our redemption. And those people will only know uh, this thing that I'm saying to you right now. Once we are bold enough to be a winner, to, to, to allow our lives to be dispensed to them in order for them to have that enlightenment about who God is. And this is Luke chapter 15 verse 7 tells us, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven. Over, not two, not three, not four, but over one sinner Okay, who had a radical change of mind about the character of God. Then, then over 99 so-called righteous, thought they are righteous people who do not need to have that radical change of mind. This is the challenge to my listeners right now. God has been challenging us to participate in this endeavor of winning the loss for Jesus. But it takes the response to the goodness and greatness of God that He did to our lives. If I want you to take note of this. Our service to God is no longer a demand a demand of God from us. Our service to God is no longer uh, a type of service that is that is you know, that is uh, compliance that because we have to, we must, we need, but it is a response. We are doing this because we will love to, we long for it, we desire for it. And I tell you, according to Luke 57, I tell you that in the same, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. In other words, every soul we are bringing to the kingdom of God, there's going to be rejoicing in heaven. There's going to be party, celebration in the heavenlies over one sinner that had a radical change of mind about the character of God. Moving on, are we really hearing the good news? Okay, from the time we came to know Jesus, uh, our pulpits are flooded with different messages. But my question is this. This is a serious question that demands a serious answer. Are we really hearing the good news? And as we all know, there, these are the topics that we keep on hearing in different churches. Okay, the topic about turn and burn. Many are highlighting so much the eternal damnation. Many are highlighting about hell, the, the eternal torment, the eternal punishment that would be happening in hell is happening in hell. And, and those demons who are partaking in that torment uh, with that unquenchable fire and, and warmth that, uh, that die, you know, that has no debt or that, that die not, okay? They're also highlighting about end times. They keep on focusing on the coming Antichrist, okay? They, 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 they paraded a lot of candidates when it comes to somebody who would become the future Antichrist. They, they keep on interpreting a lot of uh, symbols and emblems, Okay, they interpreted it. This is the sign of 666, the sign of the beast. They are highlighting the word torment. Okay, some, some pulpits are planted with messages like demon possession. 
and some are are you know being guilt trip by 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 not you if you are not giving you will be cursed but the reality is we're we're no longer under a curse and there are, there are, there are messages that we are hearing that highlights the name satan and sometimes satan became more popular than jesus they keep on mentioning satan rather than the name of jesus and there are pulpit who are uh, pulpits are flooded with the message about judgment, the, the impending judgment, the white throne judgment. But my question is this, do we really hear the good news? When we hear about turn or burn, hell, end times, damnation, torment, antichrist, 666, possession, curse, Satan, judgment, are they good news for all of us? Hey, I want you to take note of this. Jesus himself is the good news. Jesus is the perfect embodiment of theology. Jesus himself is the perfect theology. And let's continue. And whenever you uh, go beyond a message that is beyond the ordinary, many the very reason why we cannot uh, tell the truth uh, that we found when we were enlightened by our discoveries, by our research, by somebody who discipled us or shared with us. We cannot spread that message. You know why? Because we will be labeled unintelligent or we will be labeled heretical, arrogant, liberal. You, you could also be labeled as black sheep. Oh, somebody would right away say to you, that's erroneous. That's a false teaching. That message could be dangerous. You will be a troublemaker. That's full of lies. And this is the very reason why we cannot delve out the truth that we found. Because there are paralyzing words they are releasing to all of us. Labeling us heretic, liberal, arrogant. And because we believe in that labeling, okay, uh, they, they, they believe on that uh, labeling that they, they are putting upon us. Okay, we, we, we tend to shrink and not continue uh, the sharing of the truth or the good news. Let's continue. So what caused the people not to hear the good news? So like what I said a while ago, there are lots of misrepresentations. Okay, when it comes to the message or when it comes to good news on the pulpit. And most of those messages mischaracterize okay, our Almighty God. It mischaracterizes, it, it, it strips off the reality that God is eternally, absolutely, supremely good, good Father. Let me tell you this question once again. What caused the people not to hear the good news? Now, in Corinthians chapter 4, okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the God of this age, I want you to see this, small letter G, the God of this age. In other translation, the God of this generation, not other generations. The God of this age has blinded the minds, whose minds, the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Many would preach this way whenever they mention 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. They are telling us that the God of this age mentioned here is Satan. They keep on highlighting Satan as if Satan is omnipresent. Satan can be found uh, in the Garden of Eden. Satan can be found, okay, talking to God with regards to Job. Satan is at the back of uh, Peter. No, no, no. Satan is not ubiquitous. He is not omnipresent. The God of this age mentioned here uh, is not actually referring to Satan. If you would... Uh, analyze the entire uh, passage or the context of this verse. Paul was actually referring to somebody that causes the blindness of the people around. Okay? And I want you to take note of this. Those who are, who are spreading, uh, spreading uh, messages that uh, deviate from the true message of the kingdom are none other than the teachers of the law. They were those people who are spreading messages that cause blindness to 
uh, non-believing Jews. So that why the purpose of these people so that they cannot see the light of the gospel, so that they cannot see the light of the good news. What can be found in the gospel? What can be found in the good news? It displays the glory of Christ. Who is Christ? The exact representation of who God is. Who is the image of God? And this is my challenge to my listener right now. If there are people who are spreading messages that cause deceptions, lies, they were hoodwinked, it's gonna be it's gonna be a great challenge to all of us to spread what is the right message. Why? Because we want to to spread a message that will unlock mysteries, that will strip off the spiritual blindness happening to people. But it takes to have the right option, the right choice if you want to remain a sinner or eventually you want to be a winner. I want you to remember this. Apostle Paul was formerly Saul, a sinner, a notorious man belching out murderous truths against the church. But after that great encounter in the road to Damascus, there's a radical change that happened to Saul who became Paul. He, he became, from sinner, he became a winner. That's why we will be noticing in the, in the next verse that I will be mentioning the passion of Paul to share the message to other people. Again, Apostle Paul uh, wrote a letter to, the, uh, to Corinth. The God of this age, the teachers of the law, okay, the scribes and Pharisees of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. I want you to take note of this. Repentance is a change of mind, a radical change of mind. And, I, and Apostle Paul once said, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And the people around can only be transformed once you come to their lives, spread a good news, a message that would transform their thinking. It's our declaration, we are a winner, not a sinner. Moving on, let's talk about Jesus' anointing. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, it's clearly stated here, taken from the book of Isaiah, the Spirit of of the Lord, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. Okay, it's, he did not say the Spirit is in me, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. For what purpose? Because the Spirit, past tense, has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. The very, uh, okay, the, the first purpose why Jesus received the anointing is the proclamation of the good news to the poor. Who are those people who are poor? They are not those who are mendicants. They are those people who are, uh, they are not beggars in the streets. They are those people who are extremely hungry and thirsty for the very word of God. Those uh, are extremely thirsty and hungry for the good news. The, the first purpose of the anointing it's to proclaim good news to the poor. And once they, they, they came to know the good news about Jesus, according, according to this verse, Jesus said, He has sent me, the Holy Spirit sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. Hey, I, I want you to take note of this. I keep on mentioning this over and over again, that there is power in every word that we are releasing. That, But this time, having the anointing of God has to be used to proclaim the good news, has to be used to proclaim liberty to the captives. Those who are, those who are in, you know, in, in, in quote-unquote demonic captivity, not just to proclaim the good news, not just to proclaim liberty, but to proclaim as a message that will cause them to recover. Okay, their 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 the 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 sight that they lost. Okay, recovering of sight to the blind and a message that sets, okay, that set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the year of the Lord's grace. Now, I want you to take note of this. This is what I want to highlight in this verse. The purpose of the anointing that the Spirit that, that Jesus had is to proclaim the good news. 
And this is a challenge to all of us, not just to go to the church, okay, uh, sat on a few, and then listen to the message, and, and go home. God wants us to multiply the messages, the revelations we receive from Him, and let that revelation, let that revelatory insights and messages be be communicated to other people in order for them to have a radical change of mind. Moving on, let's talk about winner's wisdom. In Romans chapter 10, verse 15, as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Your life will be more meaningful once you know how to dispense that life to others. And you would realize that even Apostle Paul uh, told us in his message, in his writings to the Romans, that we are, near, we are not living for ourselves alone. He himself said, as it is written, okay, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, it's, it clearly states here, the fruit of the righteous. The fruit of those who are aligned to God and aligned to one another, the fruit of those people who are faithful in the covenant is a tree of life. And he who in souls is wise. And I want you to take note of this. Again, your life will be more meaningful once you came to see that more souls are coming to Jesus. More souls are responding to the love of God because you said a simple yes to Jesus. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Listen very carefully. Uh, Heidi Baker once said, God is not looking for the mighty. He's looking for the willing. And in the Bible, in the book of Philippians, for it is God who works in us to will and to act according to His good purpose. Let's talk about Apostle Paul's motivation. Probably you would be asking, what is that uh, fire that, cause, uh, that, that keeps burning from the heart of Apostle Paul? What, what, what motivated Apostle Paul to, to really face those persecutions in different places? in order for him to advance the kingdom message. Now, let's move on. In Romans 10, 14, this is what Apostle Paul said, How then can they call on the one in whom they have not believed? Imagine you cannot blame people of doing such a thing because they were not enlightened. Okay, the first thing that has to happen in their lives in order for them to have the transformation is to believe. To have the right belief. We cannot blame the Jews for having such culture, for having such mentality. Because if we will go back to the history of the Israelites, they were exiled in Egypt for almost 430 years. They were exposed to many gods. They were exposed to Egyptian culture. They were exposed to the wrong concept of God. And after, after that, uh, around 586 uh, BC, the Babylonian invaded Jerusalem. Many went to exile for almost 17 years. Uh, added to that is, uh, are those Jews captured by the Assyrians? In other words, they were exposed to the Babylonian culture. Their their thinking were their 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 thinkings were shaped by the culture of the Babylon of Babylon or the Assyrian culture. But I want you to take note of this, that they, there is a God up there who is so righteous. Righteous meaning means a God that who is so faithful to the covenant where He is in. But they cannot easily believe that God because they have the concept of other gods. That's why there, there, there's a time in history uh, which is called Dark Ages in an, uh, is a an era or a time where they cannot hear anything about God. No prophets are are bold enough to speak. Remember that dark ages were were almost four hundred years, and that's why Apostle Paul 
uh, in Roma said, how then can they call on the one in whom they have not believed? You cannot blame them for not believing. Why? Because there are, there are no people bold enough to come to them to speak the message. And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? You cannot blame them for not believing because they did not hear, hear about who God is. What God did for us. And how can they hear without someone to preach? And I want you to take note of this. The Bible even tells us that we need to preach in season and out of season. And Apostle Paul keeps on telling us, how can they preach unless they are sent? And I believe the mandate of Jesus for, for going to the world, to the nation, is not just for an exclusive group of people, much more. It's, it's, it would be a natural thing. It's not a demand, it's not a command, but a response. The same thing that Jesus did for us, okay, the same thing that Jesus exemplified sharing a lot of messages to the people is the same thing that God has been looking for us to do. Again, and how can they preach unless they are sent? And how can they hear without someone to preach? This is a challenge to my listeners right now. Are you willing that that life will be used okay, to, to really extend the message of God? Okay, beyond geographical boundaries, beyond racial boundaries, beyond, you know, cultural boundaries in, in one of the... In one of the uh, verses in the Bible, Jesus told the disciples, Go, get out from where you are. Get out from the place where you are staying. Go beyond racial boundaries. Go beyond geographical boundaries. Go beyond cultural boundaries. Okay? Go and preach the gospel to all nations, baptizing them, immerse them in the name, in the revelation of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all that I commanded you. And this is the promise of Jesus to the disciples. Lo and behold, I will be with you always until the end of the generation. Let's continue in Romans 1.16. I like this. And I personally believe uh, Apostle Paul having this knowledge, he, 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 he hold fast to that, he, he held fast to that knowledge of believing that, 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 that this is the very reason why Apostle Paul keep on saying, I am not, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. He himself was bold enough to proclaim, I am not ashamed of the gospel. This is the very reason why many people are not bold enough to stand in the bus, to stand in front of their lecture hall, in front of many people to witness simply because they themselves were ashamed. But Apostle Paul having, having a, a gruesome history, having uh, a not convincing past, being a being Saul, a notorious guy, a murderer. But he himself, after his transformation, this is what he said. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the good news. Why? For it is the power of God. It's not our power. It's not your power. It is his power for salvation to everyone who believes. But how can they believe when no one preaches? I want you to take note of this. We have a role to fulfill being a believer of Jesus. Instead of remaining in that old identity of being a sinner, it's time to move from being a sinner to being a winner. We need to be bold enough, not ashamed of the good news. Why? For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. This is what he said to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Actually, if we will go beyond that, after, if we will go beyond that, this, this is what Apostle Paul said, for in the gospel, the righteousness that comes from God, not from the law, not from the performance of, or self-effort, the righteousness that comes from God is what is revealed. And this righteousness is not by performance, 
This righteousness is from faith to faith. Moving on to Romans 14. Okay, verse 7 to 8. This is uh, one of the motivations that I am having right now upon hearing Apostle Paul preaching this message. This is what he said, For none of us lives for ourselves alone. And as we all know, many people are go gallipanting. They are moving, okay, roaming around the planet. For what purpose? Living for themselves alone. But Apostle Paul was emphatic when he said, For none of us lives for ourselves alone. None of us lives for ourselves alone. And none of us dies for ourselves alone. We don't want to, you know, to, to, you know, to this life to be used up in this planet just for ourselves alone. We want this life to be more meaningful. How? By 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 being an influence to the people around us, by preaching to them the kingdom message that would transform their lives. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. And I want you to get this. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. This is resounding. Whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Let's continue. Let's look at the death of the apostle of the apostles, okay? Uh, and their and the motivation. We already knew the, the the motivations, okay? What happened to them? Okay, Jesus said in Matthew chapter, uh, I think twenty-eight. He said there. Uh, 19 to 20 go and make di and make disciples of all nations get out from where you are go beyond racial cultural geographical boundaries go to all the nation go and preach to all nations baptizing them in the revelation of the father and the revelation of the son and the revelation of the spirit and teach them to obey all that i commanded you and some of the apostles of Jesus responded. In Matthew 24, Jesus said, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the nations. And then the end shall come. It shall be preached to all the Gentile nations. And then the end shall come. And many apostles responded to Jesus. And you know what happened? In Matthew 24, verse 14, it says here, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world, will be preached in the inhabited world, okay, I come in a, as a testimony to all nations, as a testimony to all the Gentiles. And then the end of this generation, the end of the old covenant age, the end of the temple shall come. And those who responded to Jesus, really face a great challenge in the response to Jesus. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, when, when the disciples were asking if Jesus would restore the kingdom to Israel, this is what Jesus responded. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. The disciples were asking for the kingdom, the restoration of the kingdom, yet Jesus answered them back with this word, but you will receive dynamis when the Holy Spirit comes on you. I want you to take note this, the kingdom of God or the kingdom is the presence of the king. The kingdom is the ruling of the king. And I want you to highlight of this, that presence is heaven and heaven is within you. The moment we are experiencing the Holy Spirit, God is actually manifesting His presence in our midst. But this is what Jesus said when the disciples were asking for the restoration of the kingdom. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. Okay? And you know when we when we see the word witness, our our mental default is that witness are a person that saw something that saw exactly what happened. 
But it goes beyond that. This word witness came from the Greek word martyrus. As if Jesus was saying this message. But you will receive dynamics. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my martyrs. You will, some of you will be martyrs in Jerusalem. Some of you will be martyrs in all Judea. Some of you will be martyrs in Samaria. Some of you will be martyrs even to the ends of the earth. If Jesus was saying to you this message, would you respond? Would you respond to the calling of Jesus to go and preach the gospel to all nations and go to all nations and preach the gospel, uh, baptizing them? Probably many of us would back out. But I want you to take note of this. After the disciples experience the dunamis, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the upper room, God granted them an extraordinary boldness and inner strength to respond to, to what God desired. Because Why? Because it's, God is not slow in His promise, not wanting everyone to perish, but all may come to a radical change of mind about who God is. And if we would notice, okay, going back, just for you to see some of the Apostles who died, Jude Tadeus, he responded, but Jude Tadeus was stoned to death. Okay, he, he responded to, to the challenge of Jesus to spread the good news, and sad to say, Jude Tadeus was stoned to death. Philip, one of the disciples or one of the apostles of Jesus, responded to the call of spreading the message of the kingdom. Sad to say, he was crucified by his soldiers. Philip the Evangelist. Thomas the Doubter, the one who was asking if he could see uh, a hole on, on the palms of Jesus or, or on his side, he responded to, 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 to the challenge of Jesus to spread the good news. Yet, Thomas was thrust with a spear. Paul was beheaded in Rome. Paul, who wrote almost one-third of the New Testament, was beheaded in Rome. He became a martyr. Another was Peter. Peter, who are, who, who are bold enough, who were the one who cut the, the, the ear of Malchus or Malchus. He responded. The one who is so bold to stand, to preach, when, when the, the Holy Spirit came, was crucified upside down because he thought he is not worthy to, to die uh, in the same way that Jesus died. So he, he, he requested that he would die upside down. He would be crucified upside down. Peter became a martyr. Apostle John died a natural death. Apostle John, the one who wrote the Revelation, and Matthew... Okay, or Levi, the tax collector, he responded to the challenge for the gospel, but he was speared to death. Another thing, Judas Iscariot, as we all know, that one of the disciples of Jesus committed suicide after he came to know that what he did was deadly wrong. And Simon was also crucified. Bartholomew was beaten, then crucified. Andrew crucified in X-shaped cross. Matthias is stoned to death. So what do I want to highlight here? Jesus did not allow them to just have a surprise of what would happen to them. Readily, Jesus said, and you will be my witnesses. You will be my martyrs. And I want you to get the heart of Paul. This is what he said. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Like what he said, many are living for themselves alone. But he kept on encouraging those people, those uh, disciples in Rome, if you will live, you will live to the Lord. And if you will die, we will die for the Lord. For, for Apostle Paul, for me to live is Christ. 
If I will continue to live, I will proclaim more about Christ. I will go um, moving all around in different places to proclaim Christ. But if I die, it's going to be a gain for me. One thing for sure, he would face Jesus. He would face his master. And he could readily say to his master, Master, my Lord, my Kurios, my Adonai, mission accomplished. My life became more meaningful on the planet because I dispensed this life to others. 